Hi, thank you all so much for joining us. I'm Susan Wilson, a producer with the Center for Art, Science and Technology. As everyone knows, the pandemic has thrown all of us into a sudden dependence on virtual events. We're all working together on navigating this new world and getting through all of the challenges and opportunities that it provides. As we all continue to iterate on the best practices for online events, we've begun to transition now from simply trying to recreate and replace traditional events to really taking advantage of a virtual format to combine the liveness and collaboration that you can find in person with the technological and locationally boundless benefits of virtuality. And I'm so pleased to introduce Chandra Ray and Peter Goddard, who will be sharing their experiences and their own best practices for virtual events with us today. Tiandra is a 2015 graduate of MIT in course four. She's an architectural designer, educator, and advocate for restorative justice. Peter graduated from MIT in 2015 with degrees in mechanical and electrical engineering and is currently pursuing a PhD in mechanical engineering, looking at ways to use aluminum waste to power desalinization and produce energy. He's also a jazz pianist and composer. Together, they co-organized Space for Action, Rebuilding a Sustainable World, a 90-minute performance conversation in April that brought together leading musicians, scientists, politicians, and activists to reflect on how the pandemic is reshaping our relationship with the Earth. We're really excited to have them with us today to share some of their insights from creating Space for Action and other virtual events. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peter and Tiandra. I am Tiandra Ray. That is Peter Goddard. Thank you for the beautiful introduction, Susan. Um, we are two MIT alum, and now T Peter is back <laughs> in the MIT student role, um, who are currently spearheading this collective called Space for Action. And it's a group of interdisciplinary folks. So we have artists, we have educators, we have musicians, scientists, um, activists, people from all the Boston community and a lot of people from the MIT community who are coming together to curate events and exhibits that help the public process the large issue of our time, which is climate change and how that affects our relationships with each other, our relationships with the earth, how it intersects with various social justice issues and disproportionately affects um, people of color in our country, America specifically. So we've had a lot of success with events in the virtual realm. We actually didn't set out um, as a virtual <laughs> organization. Um, we, we had plans to actually hold a large event and installation at MIT this past spring for Earth Day. And of course, as the pandemic hit, things shifted a little bit. So we had a few virtual um, concerts, conversations, talks all mixed together, these virtual experiences um, over the course of the past several months. And Peter is going to show us a little bit from our performance event. And we had speakers from all over. We had um, Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, who is a local minister and climate activists in the Boston area. We had rep Representative Ayanna Presley there. We had Bill McKibben um, and we had Esperanza Spalding, which was really exciting. So she did some music, some um, speaking. And we also brought in some MIT alum and some Berkeley um, professors and alum to do some original compositions. So Peter, do you wanna show us those yeah. clips? Yeah, and before I do, um, so to accomplish all that Tiantra said that we're trying to accomplish as an organization, Space for Action, uh, the most important thing for us are, are holding these events, these engaging events, where it's a conversation and it's also educational. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how to accomplish this in a virtual setting. And so what I'm about to show you are, is some clips uh, from our most recent event. And so what I want you to look out for is just the diversity in terms of content and in terms of communities that we're engaging with. Uh, as well as how sort of the talks and performances flow and um, transition from, from one into the other. And note that there, there was a uh, breakout session in here that, that I will not be showing. Um, but aside from that, just uh, take it all in and try, try to take some notes. We'll, we'll discuss this after I show you.
come together. Oh, you part of me. Scattered and carried by wind and wave to distant lands. Let us remember that wholeness is our natural state. We will now hear from Edmar Cologne and Tutti Juriat. Edmar is a saxophonist, pianist, and composer from Puerto Rico who is currently on the faculty of the Berklee College of Music. Tutti is a singer, songwriter, actor, and voiceover artist, and they have both performed worldwide. Today, they will be performing somewhere over the rainbow. So it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friends Tutti and Edmar. <laughs> I say to you, recognizing that for some of us, this actually is a statement of faith. To say that it is a good evening means to imagine and let go of some of the anxiety that we feel. We have an opportunity here, an obligation, to build a more equitable future. And I'm so grateful um, for all of you uh, frontliners, you community builders, uh, to be your sister in solidarity and actualizing that vision. And for those that don't get it, I have great confidence in your powers of persuasion and influence and storytelling to bring others along. Thank you. Our next special guest is a true force of nature that since the inception of her career has been propelling her field forward with mighty speed and depth, while inspiring many to explore their highest potential as artists and human beings. Please help me virtually welcome Grammy Award winning artist and big advocate for a climate and natural environment and paraphrasing from Reverend Mariama's words, yeah, I get to call her my dear friend, my sister, Esperanza Spaulding. I'm at the house of worship, right with pride, right with doctrine, right with sin. Now my laptop or devices where I shop for wisdom. At my very fingertips, so much more than some holy man could ever hope to comprehend. So maybe now the Holy Spirit is simply a mighty network, anchored in accumulated knowledge, now encompassing the globe. Hear our heart be like the drum, loud and sure. Feel the life rush through our veins, cool and pure. Now the oneness of our spirit shall endure. Say, oh yeah, oh yeah, come.
Oh man, it was really hard to stop a lot of those clips. But so that was uh, just a, a couple snippets. Um, if you would like to see the whole thing in full, it's, it's up on YouTube. I'm happy to share that with you. Um, you'll get our contact information at the end of this presentation. But to make this engaging, um, we're hoping that for this next part, if you're able, that you, uh, we're going to send you all into breakout rooms. And we hope that if you're able, you can sh uh, share your video and unmute yourselves. And uh, in groups of, I think, about five or so, um, we would like you to answer these two questions, talk about these two questions uh, for about 10 minutes or so. And then we'll reconvene and discuss and, and try to coalesce your responses. All right, welcome back, everybody. So now we are going to talk about these questions as a group and just if we'll call on a couple representatives from each breakout room to discuss some insights that you came up with, and we're going to use this uh, Jamboard to document some of these responses. So uh, I know, Stacy, you were taking some notes. I, I'm going to cold call on you to maybe oh, sure. kick us off. Yeah, sure. I did take some notes. Um, so we talked about, first, what makes an in-person event so special. Um, that we talked about how you can see people more and you get more nonverbal cues. Um, I did mention that at MIT, there's usually snacks and beverages, which is a plus. Um, there's a networking aspect and it feels a little bit more collegial. Um, multiple people can be talking or discussing something at the same time. And you can move around the physical space instead of sitting in front of a screen, which I think helps a little bit with event fatigue. Um, and then moving into successful versus on, unsuccessful online events, we talked a lot about um, practicing and rehearsing and making sure that your presenters understand the technology, um, having a really professional run sheet and tech backups. Um, and the more free, free form things are, the more stressful they can become. We also talked about how it's really important to understand the attention span of most people. You can't really have an hour lecture in Zoom. Um, and with that, we wanted to provide an opportunity for people to interact and we noted that breakout rooms are really effective for that. Um, we've had some success across multiple different departments with different types of icebreaker or games where people get to know each other and interact a little bit. Um, and then we talked about how if you're kind of planning your run of show, if you have something a little surprising and something kind of engaging and then other discussion points, you can have an actually a really engaging meeting. So those were our uh, points. Great. Marion or Shannon Rose, anything to add? You, you were also in the room. Um... Nope, that was a pretty comprehensive uh, representation. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you. Cool. So anyone from the other room, would you like to share some insights as to these two questions? I was nominated, so I will share our insights. From Excellent. That room number two. Um, we had a lot of overlap in what was discussed just now. Um, I would say successful in-person events, some things that we discussed that have not yet been mentioned are um, the cultivation of atmosphere in in-person events and what an impact that makes on your experience as an audience. Um, we also talked, we talked a little bit about like other people generally, um, but I would classify rather than networking what we talked about more as intimacy, like noticing other things that other people are saying, reacting to stimulus, like with other people having conversations that are spontaneous and spontaneity is like another <laughs> successful in-person event trademark, I think, the ability to be spontaneous in the conversation that you're having. Um, in direct opposition to that, uh, it was Heidi that mentioned how um, successful virtual events need to have some sort of a moderator or agenda um, if everyone's talking at once and it's sort of a free for all, it's really difficult to have a meaningful conversation because you literally cannot hear each other speak because the audio won't take multiple inputs at the same time. Um, I personally just find it really hard to have conversations on Zoom for that reason because so much of my conversation style is like, you know, spitballing. <laughs> um, so I find it really hard to talk to people on Zoom the way that I would normally speak. Um, uh, another element of successful virtual events that we talked about was um, 
uh, interactivity, which Stacy mentioned, uh, we were talking about how having an interactive element makes it easier to kind of pay attention and feel engaged in the online meeting that you're in, um, which can be really nice. Um, I think that that's pretty much everything that diverged from what Stacy mentioned. Am I missing anything? Maybe Heidi or Lydia could chime in or Catherine? On the spontaneity part, I would just add, um, we talked about running into people, which is harder to do when you're on Zoom, just the spontaneity of being out and about at like a Boston theater performance and seeing someone you know well or someone you don't know well, but I guess it happens sometimes on Zoom, but not as much. Totally. Well, I'm, I'm super impressed that you all are experts on uh, virtual events, it seems. At least you've been to enough good and bad ones to, to know the difference. So I'm just going to try to, you know, you, you've, you've all touched on all of these things um, that I'm about to tell you. But our philosophy with, with our event, which, you know, we got good feedback on. Um, and I, I tried to distill a lot of the feedback that we'd received. And, and it was very much in line with what we were all discussing here. But to kind of distill those into three guiding principles, um, we would put them into these three categories. Brevity, keep things short, keep things moving. As you all mentioned, attention spans are low, especially when you're staring at a screen, you're not up and about and, and it, moving around. And so it's best to avoid long lectures wherever possible with, uh, with only a couple speakers. Um, so if you are going to be introducing a lot of spoken or verbal content, uh, it's good to either switch back and forth between people or just have as many speakers as possible. Uh, the second guiding principle would be diversity. Uh, so it's super important to include varied content and also varied representation from different groups. And uh, continuity, actually back on that middle point real quick, um, the representation from different groups is, is key because, you know, different people are going to be, different speakers are going to be engaging to different groups of people. And so you want to have content for everyone that you expect to be on the call and, and maybe even some people you don't expect. And then the third point is continuity. So no matter what you're doing, like try to tell a story, maintain a clear theme, and the uh, transitions in particular are key. And a, a couple Zoom tips, and again, these are all basically things that people mentioned. Uh, we found that it was really good to avoid sort of the webinar style events where there's this extra layer of anonymity where you can't even see the people who are on the call. Um, it's nice to have you know, names and faces, and especially as a performer, it's really nice to look out to your Zoom screen and kind of imagine an audience. And you can, seeing all the, the squares is actually very inspiring to a performer. Have a script and practice the transitions, including sharing screen. We've all been on uh, these Zoom meetings where people don't know how to share their screen or unmute themselves, and et cetera. And mistakes obviously happen, but just, you know, try to, try to be prepared there. Um, Frequent use of breakout rooms and just encouraging people to show video and keeping them engaged at various points throughout, obviously, is a great idea. Um, for musicians, it's extremely important to set up the audio correctly. So there are all these advanced audio settings that uh, turn off the Zoom algorithms, which try to make, which are optimized for speech. And there's, in particular, this option called Turn On Original Sound, which just takes your raw input from the microphone, which is great for, for live instruments. Um, as someone mentioned, in, in our group at least, it's important to have a moderator in any large group discussions. Um, people can't be trusted to sort of self-organize when there's you know, 20 or so people. Uh, people are gonna talk over one another and then sort of the best case scenario is that everyone's just silent. So it's good to break it up into smaller groups or if it is a larger group, obviously have a moderator. Um, using a team and, and spreading out responsibilities is extremely helpful. Um, you can have someone managing breakout rooms someone speaking and, and someone, um, you know, sitting idle, ready to unmute the, uh, the person who forgot to mute themselves and is yelling at their dog, which literally happened to us. Okay. Um, and uh, in general, just be positive and embrace the format. You know, it's obviously, it's not a, a live event. And I, I think there are some benefits to doing uh, virtual events. So just try to embrace those benefits. And by the way, I will be sharing these slides, so you know, don't feel like you have to take um, notes on all of this. I'd be happy, happy to share this afterwards. So, Tiandra, do you want to talk about some things that aren't Zoom, which are pretty cool? Yes. 
So we all know and love Zoom at this point for, well, complicated relationship with Zoom maybe, but we all have interacted with this format and are interacting with it now, but there are definitely ways to enhance the Zoom experience um, by adding in elements that go beyond just the video. And just to give you a little preview of what Peter and I have been cooking up with the SFA team, we're thinking about in physical installations that are interactive via a web stream or interactive um, from afar and thinking about how we organize people in outdoor spaces, but streaming it so that it is accessible to people who cannot access the outdoor spaces. And again, different ways of interactivity um, virtually that is not just us having a conversation and interacting with physical built space, um, which is really interesting. Um, but I want to point out a couple of other tools that we've interacted with in the last few months. Um, so High Fidelity is an interesting tool. I think it was Heidi that mentioned in our group, um, enjoying like just bumping into people and being able to hear a conversation from afar. So what High Fidelity does um, is it, it places everybody on a map that you design, like a map of a space and it's a 2D map. Um, and Peter, you could click on that link, I think not the picture, the, the caption, and takes you to that page. So you're actually just a, a floating head on this map, and you actually hear in your headphones the people talking around you depending on where your icon is on the map. So Peter and I attended this like birthday party festival thing um, where they used this, and it was pretty interesting. Um, there are definitely some kinks to work out in terms of like not being awkward, <laughs> but when you're with friends, I think it especially is helpful when you're with a group of people that you already have some familiarity with, but the points on the map can be linked to different things. So we talked about whether you could link a portion of the map to a Zoom meeting. So you go to like kind of a mini breakout room and just the interesting things like that. They mapped it to a series of Google Photos um, from different past events to make people feel nostalgic and hid a scavenger hunt inside of there. So there are lots of different options. Um, for interaction there. And then there are tools like Miro boards or the Jamboard that you just saw, which are great for collaborative brainstorming. And of course, there's the whatever you all decide to come up with um, in your, your innovative, creative capacities. So we want to have a quick second breakout session and I'll post the questions in the chat where we take some time to actually brainstorm, think about what we can do with what we have and specific to all of your fields and spheres of influence and communities and preferences here at MIT. And so. actually in the spirit of improvisation and, and adapting to time constraints, we're actually mm -hmm. not going to break out. We're just gonna have this discussion amongst us. So Great. if you wanna uh, turn on your cameras right now, um, we'll just have this discussion straight up. So if you wanna speak, just because there's a few more of us than in previous breakout rooms, either raise your hand physically uh, or use the raise hand feature and I'll, I'll just call on you, I'll facilitate. And the questions are in the chat. So Peter, you can take that off the screen if you want so we can see each other. All right. So. Question one, what types of events do you imagine organizing this semester and what do they encompass? So are you thinking audio, visual, conversation, music, et cetera? Um, I'll go. I am going to be doing all of that. I oversee the arts scholars and the grad arts forum and the creative arts competition. So I'm going to be doing virtual gallery tours, virtual live streamed concerts with Zoom talkbacks, um, including conversation. I'm going to be doing, you know, um, workshop style classes on business fundamentals. I'm going to be doing a pitch finale event that's sort of like Shark Tank. Um, I'm pretty much going to be doing anything that you can imagine encompassing, you know, non-curricular education and trying to replicate some modicum of a shared musical or arts experience with conversation. Love it. Doing it all. Uh, Marion, I saw your hand up. 
Um, yes, so uh, I'm with the program in Art, Culture, and Technology, and we're going to have our lecture series online. And I was very interested in the, in the non-webinar uh, component because the thing that we're being sold on is that when you do it virtually, you can have thousands of people, I mean, or at least hundreds of people. So, so we're kind of, it looks like we're tiptoeing towards the webinar style but that won't really facilitate the kind of engagement, although many would argue that there isn't much engagement at our lecture series, but you didn't hear that from me. Um, so, so I would be very curious to hear about what your suggestions are. Great. Susan? I just wanted to really quickly, I mean, I think one of the things that I found really powerful about the Space for Action thing in the, uh, in the spring was that we did have the full audience. I think one of the things that I was talking about with a student in our sort of breakout group was you, you lose that energy um, in Zoom between a performer and the audience member. And I think that that really affects performers. And I think as an audience member, we just kind of check out more easily because we're, we're used to being a little bit visible in an audience space. Like if you fall asleep, you eventually feel embarrassed usually, you know, like, I mean, there's, there's a bit more responsibility to the moment. Um, and what I really loved about the end of that section, especially where there was so much um, community discussion and engagement with the sort of song and, and the spirit of the whole thing is that we did have, you know, everybody on camera. I mean, most people were on camera the whole time and, and, and it was really powerful to be able to scroll through and just see people experiencing the same thing that you were. And, and I recall hearing from the artists involved in that piece as well, that it, it made a difference to see people watching you um, as opposed to just kind of like looking at your own self in the camera the whole time. Um, and I think, I think those things really were really powerful and made a big difference. And it was like a small thing that I think had a huge impact. Right, we spend so much time thinking about what would engage our audience, but it's also important to engage the speakers and the performers as well. And and like Susan said, like the the quality of the performance goes way up when when people feel that pressure, um, and that support. So, any any last thoughts? Uh, anyone else planning event or ha have some new ideas for some events they would like to see even? I, this is not a specific event that I'm planning, but I am always thinking about ways to make events that combine, as Dana was talking about in our breakout room, um, some sort of gathering, but also a lot of interactive parts and games. So not necessarily, somewhere in between like a group of friends getting together to play a game and a live streamed performance. I think there would be a really cool niche in the middle there, which I, you guys achieved with the Space for Action event. Um, but this idea of incorporating both interactivity and performance in the same space. No specific ideas for that, but I um, have been brainstorming a little bit. I love it. Let's, let's make it happen. Any last thoughts? At, at this point, we could also just open it up to general questions you might have for us about uh, space for action event or just ha how we're thinking about things these days. And, uh, before I, I also want to give a huge shout out to Susan and Heidi for the space for action event. They, they both contributed a lot of content. So I'm so happy to see you here. And it's, it's awesome that <laughs> you helped make, uh, make it what it was. It was really cool. So yeah, any, any last thoughts here? I know we're kind of bumping up on our time, but. I have a quick question actually. Yeah. Um, how much of the Space for Action content was pre-recorded versus live? It was 100% live. 100% live. Amazing. Yeah. Zero recording, yeah. That's awesome. Risky, <laughs> especially that first piece, which we kind of slipped in last minute to have the drum and beats coming from one place and Peter turning on the piano from another place and Ricky singing. So I'd encourage from that for everyone to experiment <laughs> push the boundaries um you don't have to be afraid of the lag um as musicians like you can make it i mean there are definitely certain things you can't do but get creative and innovative with it um and i yeah. think marianne you were talking about the lecture series and creating something that's more engaging well maybe that means that you reimagine the lecture series and it's no longer just a lecture, but it's more of an interactive conversation and it's not just the person speaking and then Q&A, but maybe it's something that weaves differently. Um, 
if people are open to actually pushing that boundary at this point. That is the question. Oh. <laughs> and I will say we had a lot Got of a great idea. It, we, you know, we had people like Bill McKibben, Esperanza Spalding, Rep. Ayanna Presley. And, you know, people really felt like they were on a Zoom call with these people because they literally were. They felt like that you were in a very small room is very intimate yeah. with these just like incredible people you would, you would not have access to in any other setting. Um, and, you know, we could have we could have definitely asked for pre-recorded input from from each of these um, artists and, and speakers, but we really didn't want that. We we took the risk and, and just went for full live. And yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you all to to take that risk as well. It was an so, incredibly dynamic. And they interacted with each other, which was really beautiful too. Um, and allowing that mix, like the panel panel model almost works more in this context because it's not just one person talking, but you can jump off of each other. So before we um, wrap up here, I just, I'm going to share this last slide with everybody. And I would encourage you to, you could take a screenshot of this. And this is our information for Space for Action. And if, if you're interested in our organization and, and want to get involved, um, this is the information that you would need to do so. So we're, we're planning some hopefully in-person events when this is all over, but definitely some more virtual events until, until that happens. And yeah, we'd love to just engage more people. So hit us up. Peter and Tandra, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful workshop. Um, it was great to hear more about um, Seas Reaction, and I think it was really an exciting conversation. We can't wait to have more online events and then in person ones. We're very excited about that too. Um, and yeah. everyone, please stick around. Um, Arts on the Radar continues. Um, so the ACT gallery opening will be starting at five, um, and we're thrilled about that as well. It's an exciting night. And thanks to thanks Susan, everybody. Lydia, and, and Shannon Rose for you know, helping put all this together. This was fun for us as well. Thank you.